morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship as we gather this morning for worshiping our God as we continue to reflect on the theme of stewardship, looking at it through the eyes of because of you, our church changes lives. I want to let you know that, um, first of all, that if you would like to have a prayer request in the bulletin each week, lift it up there so that the rest of the congregation is aware of it. There are yellow slips either in your pew or on the table where you pack, uh, picked up the bulletin and fill those out. I do need those filled out because of HIPAA laws and all that so that we have someone to say that yes, it's okay to put them there. You can continue to lift up your prayer request as you have been during worship, but this is for being put here and eventually in the bulletin if you like that. Uh, Margaret continues to recover and Randy is now in a rehab in Wabasha, I think, of the last posting I have, so he is back to trying to rehab and um, is Randy, so he's doing well according to him, even with a little bit of pain still. So, also want to lift up that I will be starting an Advent or an Epiphany Bible study that on 5.30 at December 5th, it's a Tuesday, it will be for the next three Tuesdays and then skip a week until January 2nd. It's going to be the heart that grew three sizes. It's looking at our faith through the Grinch, how the Grinch who stole Christmas reveals aspects and informs our faith. So if you'd like to be part of that, I'm going to ask you to do what I've asked the kids to do to let me know that it reminds me that they've been at a service. If you would like to do that and want the book, please put your name on your bulletin and then either hand me the bulletin on your way out the door or put it on my desk because I know some of you told me last week you wanted the book and I said, yes, I'll order it for you and I didn't take names. So this way you'll help me and you'll actually get the book this time. So, if you'd like to be part, the book is not absolutely necessary, but it's a very good book, and it's a little bit lighter reading than what we've done for the last few Bible studies. Are there any other announcements to be shared with the congregation? Not then I invite Donna to come up and lead us in our call to worship, and for all to rise as able to body and speak. How shall we worship our God? God has told us what is good. We know what the Lord requires of us. Kindness to care for our neighbors. Until what we say and do for our one. Justice to make the world an equitable place. And in our walk in our God. Come then and let us worship. Our opening hymn is number 536, God of Grace and God of Glory. Join me in this song.
When we gather together, one of the things that we do is offer our gratitude to God for what we have, for what we have been given. And all God asks is that we share what we have been given out of what we've been given with those who are in need. Yet sometimes that can be hard to do. Please join me in our prayer of reflection. Creator God, Redeemer and Sustainer, there are so many ways we can express our gratitude to you. Offerings of wealth and pledges of time, but you expect a bit more. You have told your people what is good and right and perfect. And so today, we ask you to tell us again. Help us to see when and where to do justice and how. Help us to love kindness and teach us how to show mercy. And lead us in the ways to walk humbly beside you. We know that you are faithful in every generation, and we trust you will show us the way. Amen. Hear the good news. God is indeed faithful in every generation with God's love, God's grace, and compassion. We are always and already forgiven. We are already blessed. Please join me in our response to the assurance of grace. Spirit of the Living God, hymn number 283. <laughs> Well, part of stewardship 
which stewardship is caring for what we've been given, that God has given to us to care for, is giving thanks, is having that a word called gratitude, that we feel gratitude, we feel thanks to God, to others, for what they do, for what we have, and then out of that gratitude, we share it with others where we can, people who might need something. So maybe you can't invite someone over for Thanksgiving dinner because mom and dad make that list. But maybe you know one of your friends, this is going to be them and their parents at Thanksgiving, and afterwards you can invite them to come play for a little while or to maybe sneak a piece of pie, I didn't say that, out to them just as part of sharing what you have and giving and showing them that you're thankful for it. But it's not just on Thanksgiving. We're asked to do that every day. So look around us, and especially when we're feeling, oh, I don't know if anything to be thankful for, or we're feeling, oh, everybody hates me, yes. Do you have a question? No? Okay. Were you just rushing? Maybe. All right. We're feeling, oh, there's nothing good in my life. Sometimes looking around and remembering that our mom and dad or our grandmother loves us. Sometimes looking around and looking at our friends who like us helps us to feel better and gives us a chance to thank God. So I thank you, I thank you for coming up here and I invite you to go down to your Sunday school with the parent today. Are sharing of listening to some readings from our scriptures and God's voice speaking through them. <coughs> Both our readings did today come from the book of the prophet Micah. Now Micah is called a minor prophet and that has nothing to do with his importance but the fact that it's a very short book. So Micah is preaching and writing in a time, possibly around the time of 1st Isaiah, you might have known him also, when Assyria has already sacked the northern kingdom of Israel and its capital of Samaria, it is threatening to lay siege to the southern kingdom of Judah and its capital of Jerusalem. And he is out there telling people especially the leaders and those who are responsible for the people. Why this might be happening, as well as God's promise that God will not abandon them. So Donna is going to come up and share our first reading. Let us listen for God's voice speaking through these words. This is from Micah 4, verses 1 through 5. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's temple shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. Peoples shall stream to it, and many nations, nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that he may, we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees and no one shall make them afraid. 
for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Our second reading also comes from the book of Micah and comes from chapter 6. And the chapter 6 is laid out as if God is bringing an argument in court. And so we hear God's charge, and then we hear the people's answer, and then Micah does what a lawyer is not supposed to do in court and testifies himself. So let us listen again for God's voice is saying to us through these words. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what way have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now that King Balak of Moab devised what Balaam son of Beor answered him. And what has happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come to the Lord before the Lord, and how I bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. May God have an understanding of blessing to our hearing of these words. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and spirits be inspired by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Once again, this morning's readings seem like a strange set for reflecting on stewardship. Not that the passages themselves are strange, they're actually quite familiar. The first one we often hear at the Christmas Eve services about scrapping all our weapons and turning them into farming equipment. And emblazoned in many minds and on many walls and churches is the answer to that question of what does the Lord require? But why? Why would the creators of the resources for this series Pick a passage that turns down and tells people to keep their riches and not give them to the temple. The people seem to ask a sincere question at first, if you read it. What can we bring to God? And their suggestions, burnt offerings, rams and oil, all were acceptable offerings to make at the temple. Even that offering of your firstborn may have referred to offering the firstborn for service in the temple, if they were sincere, much like Hannah offered 
her firstborn, Samuel. In fact, the Torah tells the people that these are the offerings that they are to make to God. Yet they're refused. Can you imagine? Well, Micah can. For it seems that he's hearing our sarcastic tone behind their suggested offerings. For despite those tranquil images in the first reading, Micah has spent most of the book up until this point chastising the leaders and the elite. He accuses them of becoming rich through corruption and neglect of the poor. And that even as they boast of the beauty of their city, Jerusalem, he reminds them that that has been beautified with these ill-gotten gains. Then Michael lays out the results of their actions. First, they are being attacked by the Assyrians. And even though they will escape that just by the skin of their teeth, later the Babylonians will come in and finish the job, laying waste to the country and the city and carrying many into exile. Yet, Micah reminds them that even though God is not happy with what they are doing, God will not abandon them. Just as God has saved them before in the Exodus and from other kings, God will redeem both Jerusalem and the temple. God will redeem her people. The people, particularly those who are leaders and the elite, respond to the news of pending doom in Micah's view as if a petulant child. <laughs> what more do you want us to do? More offerings? The sarcastic tone of their answer comes through as their offerings grow to ridiculous proportions. Thousands of rams? 10,000 streams of oil? Would our firstborn satisfy you? What will it take to make you happy? What will be enough for you, God? They seem to view that their offerings are merely ways to appease an angry God or to cajole God into doing something. At times, they even use their offerings as a way to flaunt their wealth or look good in the eyes of others. Their self-provided answer to their question reveals that they have forgotten the purpose intended for the offerings that they are told to give within Torah. Burnt offerings, rams, and oils are intended to be ways of building as well as a sign of their deepening relationship with God and with each other. Yet even if the leaders aren't being sarcastic but are somehow sincere, it still isn't what God desires of them. For offerings made in this way would be no different than if today a business uses a portion of their profits, gave through unjust and dangerous practices to both their workers and their neighborhood, and then builds on the largest church and Christian education wing dedicated in their name. That isn't what God desires. More money, more resources that are given out of obligation or selfish desires, trying to serve the whims of God or God's ego. For Micah provides the answer to what it is that God desires with three directions containing nine words. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And they should already know this. They should know this for these nine words encapsulate the ethics and the way of life contained in Torah. It's a simple answer that calls them to be who they are. For as Dr. Sarah Butter explains, this is all that the Lord really wants. God wants us to be human as intended. 
When we look at it in this way, it changes the people's question from a rhetorical question into one that invites, even urges us to engage in deep human reflection. To reflect deeply on our relationship with God and with others. For what God desires for you and from you is to be human, the people you are created and intended to be. Micah 6, 8, that describes how we are to be good stewards of our lives, as intended by the one who gives life. Both individually and more importantly as communities brought together to serve and worship God. These words reflect that definition of stewardship that we've been sharing. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. For Micah 6.8 lifts up how carefully and responsibly we are supposed to live out that management of our relationship with God and with each other. The relationship God entrusts us with. All three of these director, directives are fodder for multiple sermons on their own. Because while the words are simple, living them out isn't easy. For as they did in the days of Micah, they're going to pull us in a different direction than how much of the surrounding society and culture define what they mean. So take justice. We are told that justice is about law and order, punishment and retribution. And while the Hebrew term that Michael uses, mishpat, is also a legal term for them, it's a legal term that goes far beyond criminal behavior. For a mishpat is how one treats and cares for people especially the more vulnerable people entrusted to your care. There are, of course, various and conflicting understandings of justice, Walter Brueggemann points out. So let me offer this as a way that the Bible thinks about justice. Justice is to sort out what belongs to whom and to return it to them. Such an understanding implies that there is a right distribution of goods and accesses to the sources of life. There are certain entitlements that cannot be mocked. While Brueggemann focuses on sorting out goods and resources, justice does not end there. Mishpat also encompasses how people are viewed by others how they're treated. Doing justice under this includes taking actions where and when anyone is treated as less than human. Rabbi Abraham Herschel describes his understanding of justice as coming from the prophets. They taught him that morally speaking, there is no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings. That indifference to evil is worse than evil itself. That in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Bishop Desmond Tutu saw it this way. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. For if an elephant has stepped on the tail of a mouse, and you say that you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Our second directive to love kindness also sounds simple. But here again, that Hebrew word for kindness, hesed, goes far beyond being friendly and considerate. It can notice a deep relationship and commitment to the other's well-being. Loving Hesed is loving others in a deep and meaningful and active way. Ways at times that will be inconvenient, even uncomfortable for us, but is to the benefit 
of the other. Hesed is used in Torah to describe God's character, the character of God's relationship with us. For Hesed looks like devotion and care for a beloved spouse. Hesed enacts the actual welcoming of those foreign to us, whether they be from those from foreign countries, to those whose ways or understandings seem strange to us, even to those whose political persuasions seem foreign to us. Finally, God longs for us to walk humbly with God, not just be humble, but to walk humbly with God, in the ways of God. Dr. Erica Brown believes that walking humbly for the prophet is walking with eyes wide open to the presence of anyone in need, waiting to perform acts of mercy, justice, and loving kindness. By suggesting that humans walk with God, it's actually God who humble, who models humility by deigning to walk beside us. If God can walk with us, then we can and must walk beside those less strong, those less competent, those less fortunate. In the end, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God is about stewardship. It tells us how to care about and for the relationships with God and with others that God entrusts to us. As Reverend Butter points out, that stewardship doesn't just include what we give to churches or other organizations that do justice and love kindness. These nine words go beyond just the budget and transform those sarcastic questions asked in Micah 6 into ones for us to deeply consider. With what shall I come before the Lord? How shall I show up to God? What shall I bring? What should I give? What different way Shall I go? The answer from God always seems to come down to two words. Show up. Show up for me. Show up for others. Because that is how you show up for me. So Butter concludes, these ways of showing up carry us into life-giving, reciprocal, transformative relationship with God and with God's other beloved children. Stewardship asks us, what do we do to offer those life-giving, transformative relationships with God and with God's beloved children? What do you offer to nurture them until they bloom fully? Micah 6 a provides us with one possible answer. Whatever allows us to be part of doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God. Practicing good stewardship involves how we live until that day when no nation takes up arms against another, when there is no use for a military, and all have what they need as God promises. For stewardship is whatever we have that allows us to follow, follow the risen one who claims us and calls us to join him in changing lives as individuals and as communities of faith until that day that God's reign is lived under by all. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as able and join me in the singing of hymn number 588.
let justice flow like streams. Generous and abundant God, what you desire from us is simple, to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. And ye only ask that from what you have already given us, 
And for this, we are thankful. For too often, the messages we hear aren't very loving or humble, and certainly not about your ways of justice. When we hear that retribution and punishment are the only ways to deter, deter violence, remind us that you call us to offer a justice that reflects your ways of compassion. When justice is defined as court decisions on who does and doesn't go to prison, show us how justice requires the care of all in ways that provides all with what they need to flourish. When we would minimize walking with you until it becomes only about how that walk benefits and comforts us, Reveal that walking with you also requires walking with others, as you already do. And oh, that we did this already, God. Then the war between Hamas and Israel, the battles in Ukraine and Russia, the violence between nations and factions would all end with reconciliation and concern for each other's needs. Show us how to be your peacemakers, bearers of your justice and light, so that all recognize and can respond to each other as the beloved child of God that they are. If only we lived this way, no one would need to fear sending their child to school, going to the office, or picking up a few things at the store may be the last time that they leave home. If only we would, hungry and hunger and poverty would be memories. Thank you for providing an abundance that can meet the needs of all. If only we would use these gifts to live lives of kindness instead of grasping more than our share. Open our hearts and actions to love in ways so that all can have their own place to dwell in the security of your love. For there is much to be grateful for, O oh God, in this day, in this week, and in this life. We are grateful for new life such as grandson Rory, that brings to Jacob and his wife, to Eric and Liz, and to all who get to experience his smile. We're grateful for these chances, these excuses to put aside our busyness and to gather. Gather whether it be for Thanksgiving or as hunting. And we pray for the hunters that they are safe and kept safe so that no one is hurt through these hunts. And we lift up Linda's daughter, even as we reach out and care with her, as the children from both churches make cards for a care package. We pray for her unit that is deployed in Iraq, for their safety, and that they may serve there in ways that protect their humanity, and allow them to share their compassion. We pray for those who wait on this side of the ocean, wondering if they too must go there. Grant them peace and serenity during this time. And God, we lift up to you all those who are hurting in mind, body, and spirit. We lift up three among us, especially who are hurting but are recovering. We lift up Paul and Randy and Margaret. Holy God, we lift up all these prayers, as well as the unspoken ones of our hearts and spirits. In the name of Jesus, using together the words with which he taught us to pray, our Father,
So we come to that time when we give our offerings so that this congregation may do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God, both inside and outside these walls. Let us take up this morning's offering.
were expecting that we would be focusing on Thanksgiving. I do Thanksgiving in Wisconsin the week after the Sunday after Thanksgiving because the week before is the opening of deer hunting season. And as you can see, there's not a lot of people here. And hopefully at least some of them will have gotten their deer by next Sunday and can join us. We often focus when we talk about stewardship on budgets and money and making the bottom line. And stewardship is so much more. Stewardship is about the life that God has entrusted to us. Our individual lives, our lives as congregations, our lives with our family and friends, and using it with care. Care that goes out and shares God's love, God's justice, God's kindness with others. And so as we continue to think about stewardship, I invite you not to think about what you can give, not to think about how it would meet something, but how do you use, how do we use our budgets, our time, our talents as tools to offer good stewardship? instead of being the end of, and purpose of stewardship. And so, our worship has ended, but the offering we make to God continues to unfold in what we say and in what we do every day. God has told me this, to be kind and merciful, to do justice, and to our May God bless you and keep you until we meet again.